Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be covering different types of pneumothorax, and we're also going to be touching on chest tubes. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so go ahead and give it a thumbs up now before you forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you'll find plenty of resources. You can sign up for next generation. <coughs> Excuse me. NCLEX review part one and part two in part one. I teach you how to think like the test writer. I teach you about different scenarios that um, may be presented and where your mind is supposed to go. I teach you about different phrases and where your mind is supposed to go. I teach you about priority. I teach you about delegation. I teach you about critical thinking. All of that is part one. In part two, we actually get into the different types of questions you should expect to see. Not the exact questions, but those same types of questions, those types of scenarios, those types of concepts. So you can sign up for both part one, part two. If you're a current nursing student, I have something for you. I have audio lessons. If you're doing not so well in your courses and you really have to have a high grade on your next exam to pass, check out my audio lessons that I have available. And also you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one private tutoring session, or maybe you just need to pick my brain about something. All of that can be found on my website, again, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and right here on YouTube, my handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Now, before we get started, I want to start off with a quick prayer. And if you're not into that, that's fine. Just fast forward. And if you are not operating heavy machinery, please close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for another day on this earth. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Father God. Thank you for another opportunity that you've given us to uh, just be alive and be able to come here and go over this information. Lord, I ask that you please bless every single viewer, every single listener. Uh, for whatever reason they came to this channel, whatever it is that they're trying to learn, that they're trying to understand, that they're trying to grasp, Father God, I ask that you please make it clear as day for them, Lord. I ask that you please help me to present this information in a way that the students can understand, that they can retain and remember, Father God. Please help them to be able to apply these concepts in other scenarios that they see, Lord. I ask that you please help them in their studies, Father God. Help them do well on their exams. Give them the discipline that they need to study accordingly, Father God. Lord, I ask that you remove those obstacles in their way, including people, Father God, that are um, a hindrance to them moving forward. Lord, I ask that you please bless them. And I thank you for all that you've done in our lives and all that you will continue to do in our lives. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. Here's the first question. A 28-year-old male presents with sudden chest pain and shortness of breath. He has no history of trauma, but has a history of smoking and is tall and thin. The nurse suspects a spontaneous pneumothorax. Which of the following assessment findings would support this diagnosis? A, dullness on percussion of the affected lung. B, decreased breath sounds on one side. C, bilateral crackles upon auscultation. Or D, equal chest expansion. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is B, decreased breath sounds on one side. So let's go back to the question. We're talking about a patient that's having these symptoms and the nurse suspects that the patient has a pneumothorax, okay? A spontaneous pneumothorax, because remember, there are different types of pneumothorax. What's a spontaneous pneumothorax? Well, that's when there's like a rupture of the small air sacs. Those are what's known as blebs, and um, they're on the surface of the lungs. When they rupture, that's what is a spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, let's talk about the risk factors for a spontaneous pneumothorax. It's right there in the question. What are the risk factors? Being male, having a history of smoking, being tall and thin. But the question is asking us, what would support this diagnosis? Here are the options. And of course, it's B, decreased breast sounds on one side. Well, I just told you that a spontaneous pneumothorax is a rupture of those small blebs on the surface of um, the, the lung, right? So it would make sense that the patient would have decreased lung sounds on that side of the lung. By the way, they'll have decreased lung sounds. They can have chest pain. They can have difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. All of those are signs and symptoms. Now let's talk about the wrong answer choices. A, dullness on percussion of the affected lung. This is something we see in like pleural effusion or atelectasis, or maybe the, if the patient had like a mass or tumor in the lung, then it would be something like A. 
Look at C, bilateral crackles upon auscultation. When you hear crackles, what, what does that tell you? Fluid is present. So this would be something if there was fluid presence in the lungs. D, equal chest expansion. Well, that's good. We want the chest expansion to be equal. We want it to be symmetric. We want it to be bilateral. That's a good thing. So for this question, when they're asking about the spontaneous pneumothorax, B is a correct answer. Again, we expect to hear decreased breath sounds. Patient can have shortness of breath. They can have difficulty breathing. They can have uh, um, chest pain on that side. Next question. A nurse is caring for a patient with attention pneumothorax. Which of the following is the most crucial intervention? A, apply nasal cannula to provide oxygen. B, perform chest physiotherapy. C, prepare for needle decompression. D, administer a bronchodilator via nebulizer. What do you guys think? Okay, guys, and the correct answer is C. Prepare for needle decompression. By the way, when you see a uh, tension needle thorax, that's where your mind needs to be going to needle decompression. All right. So let's talk about this. First of all, tension pneumothorax is different from a spontaneous pneumothorax. Remember, in spontaneous pneumothorax, we were talking about those blebs, those air sacs that just basically ruptured, right? But in tension pneumothorax, by the way, it's a medical emergency. This is where um, air enters the pleural space, but it can't escape. I want you to think about this. Air is entering the pleural space, but it cannot escape. You breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Air is entering. So we got air going in, going in, and going in, and going in, and going in, but not going out. That air has to go somewhere. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, this is what's happening, right? So the question is, what's the most crucial intervention? Decompression. Because the problem is that air can't go anywhere. And by the way, guys, right after that needle decompression, what do you expect to be inserted? Chest tube? Yeah. So let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, apply nasal cannula to provide oxygen. Oxygen is not the problem. The patient's getting enough oxygen. The problem is that oxygen is not escaping. Okay? B, perform chest PT for what? It's not like the patient has all these mucus plugs that we got to break up so that they can cough up. That's not the problem. The problem is air entering the pleural space and not being able to escape. So that's causing increased intrapleural pressure. And then choice D, administer a bronchodilator via nebulizer. That would be great if the patient has had bronchoconstriction, but that's not what's happening. Again, air is entering that pleural space and it's not escaping. So we're going to do uh, assist with a needle decompression. And we go, after that, we're going to assist with that chest tube insertion. So choice C is the correct answer. We have to relieve all that pressure that's being built up because that air can't escape. Which of the following is a priority assessment for a patient who developed a tension pneumothorax? A, check for neck vein distension, B, assess for cyanosis of the lips, C, monitor for hypotension and tracheal deviation, or D, palpate for crepitus around the chest too. C, monitor for hypotension and tracheal deviation. So I want you to think about this. I just explained to you that in tension pneumothorax, air is entering the pleural space, but it's not escaping, right? All right. And that air has to go somewhere. So what's it doing? It's pushing, it's pushing, it's pushing against other organs, such as what? The heart. This is what makes it a medical emergency. Okay. That pressure is increasing and that increased pressure guys decreases blood return. It's going to decrease cardiac output. So you're going to see hypotension and what tracheal deviation It's being pushed what to the unaffected side. Why? The affected side is where all of that air is being trapped. The air has got to go somewhere. So it pushes, it pushes, it pushes towards the unaffected side. And so you'll see tracheal deviation towards the unaffected side. You can see compression of organs towards the unaffected side. This is a medical emergency. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, check for uh, neck vein distension. We would see that in something like fluid overload. B, assess for cyanosis of the lips. We would see something like that in hypoxemia or hypoxia. And then D, palpate for crepitus around the uh, chest tube side. We would um, feel that something like if the patient had um, 
subcutaneous emphysema, right? Air being trapped under the skin, then you could may feel that um, crepitus because the air is trapped under that subcutaneous tissue. But what we're talking about is a tension pneumothorax. So it would be C, you're going to monitor for decreased blood pressure because of that decreased uh, cardiac output and um, tracheal deviation. Remember, everything's pushed what? Towards the unaffected side. A patient with a chest tube is placed for a traumatic pneumothorax asks the nurse what the purpose of the chest tube is. The nurse's best response is A, a patient with a chest tube is placed, excuse me, A, a ch chest tube removes air and fluid from pleural space to allow your lung to re-expand. B, chest tube allows the air to bypass the lungs, helping you breathe better. C, it's used to prevent the air from entering your lungs. Or D, it helps drain the infection from your lungs. And the correct answer is A. Chest tube removes air and fluid from the pleural space to allow your lungs to re-expand. So now we're talking about a different type of pneumothorax. What type of pneumothorax? Look at the question. It says traumatic pneumothorax. Well, think about it. Trauma to the area. Patient had injury or trauma such as NVA. Maybe they got stabbed, but it's trauma. So the trauma is what's causing air and or fluid entering the pleural space. Okay. So the chest tube is going to help to remove it. Now, let's, let's look at the wrong answer choices. B, the chest tube allows the air to bypass the lung. The lungs is what's in trouble. Why are we bypassing the lungs? False. C, it's used to prevent air from entering your lungs. No. When a patient gets a chest tube, air has already entered um pleural space, and we're trying to remove that air and or fluid, Right? False. And then D, it helps drain the infection from your lungs. No, it removes what? Air and fluid for, that's being trapped in the pleural space of the lungs. Okay, so that's why A is a correct answer choice. A nurse is educating a patient about risk factors for spontaneous pneumothorax. Which statement indicates that the patient needs further teaching? A, I'm more at risk because I'm tall and thin. B, smoking increases my risk for spontaneous pneumothorax. C, it's good to have at... Is it's good that I have asthma because it lowers my risk? Or D, I would be at higher risk because I have a history of emphysema. All right, and this question is asking us which one requires further teaching. Whenever a question asks which requires further teaching, which requires follow-up, which requires clarification, which would you question? What they're really asking you is which one is the wrong answer choice. And we're talking about a spontaneous pneumothorax. So which is false about a spontaneous pneumothorax? And that's C. It's good that I have asthma because it lowers my risk. No, having a chronic respiratory condition increases your risk. Having something like asthma bronchitis, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, that increases your risk. All of the other choices are true regarding spontaneous pneumothorax, and that's why we did not choose that as the answer. The nurse is reviewing the chart of a patient diagnosed with iatrogenic pneumothorax. Which of the following is mo the most likely cause of this condition? A, trauma from a motor vehicle ac accident. B, spontaneous rupture of a lung bleb. C, complication from a medical procedure such as a central line insertion, or D, air embolism following scuba diving. And I'm hoping you guys at least narrowed it down to C and D because I've already talked about A and B, right? The correct answer is C, complication from a medical procedure such as central line inser insertion. So let's go back to the question. What are we talking about? Iatrogenic pneumothorax. That is a collapsed lung that's caused during some type of medical procedure, but it was it was accidental, okay? It was unintentional collapsed lung that was caused during some type of medical treatment or medical procedure, such as a central line insertion, right? It can also happen after like a lung biopsy or a thoracentesis or maybe like mechanical ventilation. You're trying to help the patient and then you accidentally cause a collapse of the lung, all right? That's your iatrogenic pneumothorax. A, Trauma from a motor vehicle accident. What type of pneumothorax is that? Traumatic pneumothorax, yes. B, spontaneous rupture of a bleb. What type of pneumothorax is that? 
spontaneous pneumothorax. You guys are so smart. Last, D, air embolism following scuba, scuba diving. I haven't talked about that yet. Do you guys know what that is? By the way, it's not a type of pneumothorax. This is um, an arterial gas embolism, A-G-E, arterial gas embolism, okay? And, you know, an air embolism can happen after scuba diving going so deep underwater. So anyway, for this question, guys, the correct answer is complication from a medical procedure. But remember, when it comes to iatrogenic pneumothorax, that medical procedure that caused the pneumothorax, it was unintentional. A patient with a hemothorax secondary to chest trauma has a chest tube inserted. Which of the following findings would the nurse report immediately to the healthcare provider? A, a decrease in chest tube drainage over the last hour. B, serosanguinous drainage from the chest tube. C, continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. Or D, sudden increase in bright red blood draining from the chest tube. And the correct answer is D, sudden increase in bright red blood draining from the chest tube. Even if you had no idea what this answer was, the fact that you saw sudden, that should have been your first red flag, okay? And bright red. Bright red means what? Active bleeding. Patient has active bleeding and it's sudden. Do you think that's a good thing? No, okay? There's been a change, but the change is for the worse. We're going to be concerned. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, a decrease in chest tube drainage over the past over the last hour. Okay, good. Keep monitoring your patient. Uh, B, serosanguinous drainage from the chest tube. Good. Keep monitoring your patient. C, continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. Now, that's not good because you should suspect an air leak, but that doesn't require you calling the healthcare provider right away. You're gonna start doing some assessments. You're gonna check the tube, right? But A, seeing a decrease in the drainage, we want that drainage to gradually become less and less. And even if you suspect that something's wrong because um, that drainage shouldn't be decreased so fast, you still wouldn't call the healthcare provider. You still do an assessment first. And B, seeing that serosanguinous drainage, that what we, that's what we want to see. What we don't want to see is bright red bleeding, which means the patient has active bleeding going on. And that's why D is the correct answer choice. A 40-year-old patient has a small primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Oh, I just said a mouthful. The nurse anticipates which of the following treatments. A, insertion of large bore chest tube. B, needle aspiration or small bore catheter insertion. C, immediate surgery to, res to resect part of the lung. Or D, no intervention as a small neurothax as a small pneumothorax often resolves on its own? And the correct answer is D. And usually you never choose the answer of do nothing, right? There's always something to do, but sometimes you just continue to monitor. And the correct answer is D. Let's go back to the question. It tells us that the patient has a small, that's our first clue, um, Primary spontaneous pneumothorax. So, so let's talk about this. We know what a spontaneous pneumothorax is. We know that it's rupture of those small air sacs that we call blebs under um, um, the, the lung surface, right? We know what that is. But that word primary, what does that mean to us? So we know the patient has a spontaneous pneumothorax, but primary, what does that mean? It's not caused by some type of lung disease or trauma. If it's secondary, yes, it was caused by something else, right? But if it's primary, it was not. So here we have a small, by the way, when I say small, that means that like the size of it is like less than centimeters. That's what it means, okay? A small spontaneous pneumothorax that's not caused by some type of underlying respiratory disorder. Now let's get into it. What do you expect to be done? No intervention. It's going to be watch and wait because usually, because they're so small, they just resolve on their own. Usually no intervention is going to be needed. Let's say it gets worse, right? What would you expect? You would expect be, <coughs> excuse me, needle aspiration or small bore catheter insertion. 
If it's worse than that, you'd expect a insertion of large bore chest tube. And last, if it's really, really bad, oh my gosh, patient's going to have to go into surgery and get a, re a resection. And this goes across the board for nursing, guys. We always like to go from least invasive to most invasive. So if you ever get an ordered response question where you have to put things in order and you have no idea what the order should be, go from least invasive to most invasive. That's going to increase your chances of getting the question correct. In a patient diagnosed with attention pneumothorax, what is the most likely pathophysiological change that, need, that leads to a med medical emergency? Is it A, collapse of the entire lung causing bilateral chest pain? Is it B, air accumulation in the pleural space causing mediastinal shift and compression of the heart? Is it C, rupture of the pleural space causing infection and pleuritis? Or is it D, fluid accumulation in the lungs causing pulmonary edema? And guys, the correct answer, let me take a sip of my coffee first. The correct answer is B. Air accumulation in the pleural space. Remember, we're talking about tension normal thorax. The tension is increasing because the pressure is increasing. This is air that's being trapped that is not being released. So it's pushing, pushing, pushing on vital organs such as what? The lungs and the heart. I meant to say heart, not the lungs. Well, yes, lungs too, but primarily the heart. That's what is causing the medical emergency, right? Everything shifts towards the good side, the good, the good lung, the heart. That's life-threatening. All right. Last question, which of the following patients is at highest risk for developing a secondary pneumothorax? A, a 35-year-old male who's tall and thin. B, a 50-year-old woman with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. C, a 22-year-old woman with no significant medical history. Or D, a 30-year-old male with a history of smoking but no other health issues. And I know you guys all chose B because I already told you that primary means no underlying respiratory condition where secondary, yes, there was an underlying respiratory condition. B, the patient with COPD, look at A, patient who's tall and thin. Well, that's a risk for spontaneous um, pneumothorax. Uh, okay, there's no secondary uh, uh, respiratory condition here. Look at C, the patient with no significant medical history. And then D, yes, the patient has a smoking of his, uh, a history of smoking, but no history of health issues such as lung cancer, pneumonia, uh, tuberculosis, bronchitis, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, right? And so that's why B is the correct answer. And guys, that's it for this video. I hope that I cleared it up for you, the differences in the pneumothorax and we touched up on some uh, chest tube. But if you'd like to see more on the subject, please go ahead and let me know in the comments section. I'd be more than happy to make another video part two on the subject matter. If there's something that you feel I haven't discussed yet or you'd like me to discuss further, go ahead and let me know in the comment section. I can't respond to everyone, but I do read your comments and I take note and I try my best to reach your expectations. So just let me know in the comment section. Guys, be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching. You guys will catch me on the next video.